41 before missing out on the Melbourne coaching job by a single vote at the end of 1948. He transferred to Fitzroy as captain coach for three seasons between 1949 and 51 before returning to Melbourne as non-playing coach in 1952. Smith presided over the Demons' greatest era, leading the club into eight grand finals for six premierships in 11 years, and shared a remarkable relationship with superstar player Ron Barassi, who lived with Norm and his family throughout his teenage years. Smith's shock sacking midway through 1965 was one of the biggest football stories of the 20th century. He was reinstated after an unparalleled public outcry just a few days later. He departed Melbourne in 1967, only to return to the coaching ranks with South Melbourne in 1969, leading the Swans into the finals in 1970, their first September action in 25 years. When Ron Barassi took the reins at North Melbourne in 1973, Smith accepted a mentoring role behind the scenes, but a sustained period of ill health ultimately claimed the life of this football legend midway through the season. Norm Smith was named as the AFL Coach of the Century in 1996, the same year in which he was inducted as an inaugural member of the AFL Hall of Fame. How did it come to be that you uh, went to live with Norm and his family when your mum decided she was going to move to Tassie? There's, there could have been problems in getting back from Tasmania if I was, if I was going to be, become good enough to be invited back. Uh, so rather than do any of that sort of stuff, uh, and I was in the football loop as I was with the Melbourne Thirds and uh, we had this good year and I, you know, I'd shown a bit of form and was going to get invited up to the seniors, try out for the senior list so, so to speak, so it was just better football wise and uh, uh, mum bought a bungalow and it was, uh, it was put up at the back of the Smith household in Pasco Vale and uh, it's a very good idea to live with a coach. Uh, uh, perhaps I mightn't have made it if I hadn't have. No, I'm only joking there because Norm was actually tougher on me than other players because he didn't want anyone saying, hey, Ron, you're, you're favouring your, your border, Roger the Lodger, you know. You. So uh, uh, he wasn't like that. In fact, I can remember uh, he went to the, to the stage where even in my first game uh, I had to get out and, on a Friday morning to, to read the newspaper that I was in the side. He could have easily told me, Sitting around the kitchen before. table. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, but he wouldn't because, uh, well, it didn't happen to any other player. Uh, so, and, and he's quite right because it's a saying put this way uh, you can have favourites, that's human nature. In fact, you probably can't stop having favourites uh, as a human nature thing. Uh, but you mustn't play favourites, you know. And, and I couldn't agree more with that, by the way. So, was Norm scrupulously fair? Was that one of the things that yes. uh, was high on his list of morals? Uh, he was a very, very ethical uh, guy, you know, very ethical, so that was definitely one, no doubt. Norm Smith was uh, the old school uh, boy subject, uh, the most indelible character you've ever met. He would be one of the most indelible people that I've ever met. Uh, what came through with him and what communicated uh, with the public was his utter sincerity and his toughness, uh, but he also had a great sense of fairness. and. Uh, his word was his bond, and he expected others to live up to those high standards. During those 60s, when I was at the Sun News Pictorial, we were always dead scared of him. He was always Mr. Smith. And that booming voice of his, I, know, I can understand now why all those demon players were really scared, really scared when he sort of came to the room because they all stood to attention, no one spoke out of turn. They were wonderful days though for the Melbourne Football Club because they dominated the whole football scene. Every kid had a Ron Barassi, number 31 Guernsey on his back and it was, um, the MCG was the, the real focus of football with Melbourne training there all the time and Barassi used to strut around town as though he owned the joint and uh, Norm of course was the the overseer, the guru, the, and everyone admired him. We'll come back to Norm's coaching in a moment, but starting with his playing career, he was a, an exceptional player in his own right, and it's probably just that his coaching career was so phenomenal that that in many ways overshadows what a great player he actually was. Oh, he was a very good player. I mean, his, his, his efforts at full forward as an example. And I think during a couple of the war years, uh, he played in the centre and won, uh, I think he won... Uh, a Herald Player of the Year, yeah, Player of the Year, yeah. as a centre man. Uh, no, he was very competent in whatever he did. I mean, he's a very good cricketer. He, uh, he played for the uh, Melbourne First in cricket. So, and I, 
got no doubt of it, it had been a different time, like non-war, and uh, he concentrated on cricket that he could have made a, at least the, the state side. He was had a tremendous eye. I, 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 I know him at tennis and golf and table tennis, which he used to thrash me out as a kid, you know. Mm. He didn't like that at all, but he had a great eye and a natural, a natural sportsman, yeah. We always knew him as uh, Norm Smith. Trench coat on, hat, gruff voice. What are you doing here, son? And we used to have trouble every Saturday when we had to go and interview him at the MCG or anywhere else because you had to find him. There's no long, there were no press conferences in those days where everything's organised. Norm had these little uh, covens that he had all through the MCG, little committee areas, and you had to go and find him. And it took hours sometimes. And then you'd go up to him and say, um, Mr. Smith, yes, what do you want, son? Could I get a comment from you? What about today's win? And he'd say, well, what do you think about it? I said, well, the scoreboard looked pretty good. Well, you write the story the way you want to write it, son, because I don't want to have much to do with this. And there was one time there when he fell out with the Sunday uh, boys, you know, Jack Dunn, Kevin Hogan, Rex Pullen, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't talk to us. And uh, we still had to go down and interview him. And I remember one time I went down and uh, I knocked on the little committee room just off the the uh, training room and uh, he came to the door and he said uh, Sunday Sun News Pictorial yeah get lost so I went back and I told him get lost and Jack Dunn who was a terrific old bloke said I'll fix Norm Smith up don't worry about that so he said uh, from now on we quote him direct whatever he says so Jack then went down next week and uh, he got hold of Norm and he said just say you didn't see me so from that moment on Coaches come in on a Saturday, Norm Smith, just say you didn't see me. Next week, get lost, uh, I'm not talking to you blokes, all this sort of stuff. It took about three or four weeks until the Melbourne committee said, uh, hey Norm, this is making us look like guilt dills here. You better change your attitude. And we got back into the system. Yeah, as the old expression goes, one pat in the head, two kicks in the bum. Uh, Smithy probably worked on one pat in the head, eight kicks in the bum. Uh, and uh, no, he just had that uh, uniqueness and, uh, and that uh, awe about him that just made you listen. Tell us about the relationship between Norm and Len, because Len uh, in particular is considered to be in many ways the forefather of the modern game. He was a very innovative thinker and one of the first, if not the first, to really put down his theory on Australian football and how it should be played in print. Here are the points. This is how you go about it. Yeah, well you're well briefed young fella because uh, that's exactly what Norm Smith would say. He always deferred to his brother as being the football brain in the family and he listened intently to his brother and they always discussed tactics and whatnot. He said that Len Smith was the brain of Australian rules football. Did Norm coach to a, 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 a reasonably set plan? Was he an innovative coach or was he, here's my players, I'm going to prepare them well, I'm going to send them out there in their positions and they do what they're told? No, no, he was flexible. He, he was incisive and uh, he was imaginative and he made some fantastic moves which uh, others uh, regarded as inspirational. When you turn up to pre-season training, if you're just walking in the door at Melbourne as a 17-year-old kid and you've heard of his reputation but you've never met him, what can you expect from Norm well, Smith? Well, you'd be shivering in your timbers, I would think. Was just, you, you would have heard beforehand that he's a, a no-nonsense guy. Uh, on match day, on training night, whatever, when, when the business of football training or playing is about to, to, to start, you know, that's what he was on about. And uh, you had to be very serious and, he, and you would... Uh, would have heard, I knew all this beforehand, so because I, I knew Norm, I knew that he, he wouldn't put up with any uh, rubbish, any half-hearted attempts, he just wanted a, a full out of effort. Norm's uh, ideas on, on football, uh, ideas about life and, and everything else, uh, you know, really had an impact, you know, on myself. Uh, he had that... Um, wonderful aspect of never forgetting people's names and uh, uh, and, and such uh, we used to reckon he had the tape recorder up in the up in that brain and uh, and such uh, norm always said that his brother len was a better coach than he was uh, well you know i can't agree with that but maybe len might have got more out of lesser people because they were so different uh, they were so different you wouldn't believe that they were raised by the same parents uh, len you know i think cajoled people to do things norm 
probably worked on the fear factor. We were all petrified. Uh, it, and I've uh, heard from the Melbourne guys how he used to treat Barassi and, uh, and then I, I found out, uh, you know, the hard way uh, how, he, how he treated the guys he called number one at uh, South and, and whatever. Uh, he didn't rip the kids to pieces. He, he ripped his top players to pieces. And, uh, but if people came in at half time and, and heard what he said to players uh, they would probably say that those two will never talk again uh, but he had that happy knack of having it eating out of his hand again that night but he was a natural soft person i can re remember uh, uh it must have been about 1949 or 50 uh, he's coaching fitzroy and, and mum and i are over at uh, his uh, his place on the saturday morning before Melbourne, his team that he just left, so it must have been 49, uh, left, uh, uh, was going to play Fitzroy, his team. And uh, he said to me about 10 o'clock, come on Ronnie, we'll go down and see Mum. So we hop into this old vehicle he had and tootle down about two mile uh, to his mother's place and we go in and have a cup of tea and then we come out and uh, off we go. and. Uh, about two minutes later, we're back in front of his house. And I'm, I'm only 49, so I'm 13. Uh, I looked at him and I think, oh, he must have forgotten something. So he, he sits there and then we take off again. This happened three times. And the third time I looked across, uh, he was crying. He was crying. He was under... He was going to play against his mates, he, you know, and uh, so I knew then that he had a, had a soft heart, yeah. I can illustrate this best by saying that in the first season, one of the things that is that I was very lucky, my first captain was a guy called Hassaman. Hassaman was just a great person, terrific mentor, but also a very courageous player who put his body on the line, you know, uh, didn't have a big build or anything like that, and the number of times he got crunched running backwards in the pack was amazing. But what I couldn't believe is how, how Norm tore strips off him. In a couple of weeks, he, he, in front of the rest of us, he berated Hassa and questioned his courage and everything like that. And, and I genuinely got upset about it. And, and I went and, and sought out Hassa. And I said to him, look, I know I'm only a youngster, but I'm telling you, I'm, if, Nick, if Norm does that again, I'm having a go at him. Because there's one thing you don't do, you don't pull out. And he's got no right to do that. And he gave, grabbed me aside and he said, hey, young fella, don't do that. He said, this is coach, captain, speak. He said, he knows I don't pull out. But what he's doing is he's sending a message to all the other kids in the team that don't you dare pull out because this is what I do with the skipper. I thought, wow, how good is that? How good is that for man management? Got me, got me and sucked me in. And I just say this again, that, that sometimes the perception and the ways and means. And so he was a person from outside, might have been tough and, and he would have been at times, but he knew his mark. He knew who he could go to, who he could say, and what he needed to do in certain terms to get the best out of people. So, Ron, here's Norm Smith at the top of the football tree. He's won, at that point in time, five premierships with Melbourne. He's untouchable. He's a larger-than-life figure. He's got this amazing aura about him. He's led the demons out of the wilderness. How did it come to pass that in 1965 the unthinkable happened? Norm Smith was sacked by the Melbourne Football Club. Well, my theory about it is it started a couple of years before when Norm, in a radio interview after a match at the MCG, uh, criticised uh, umpire Blue's decisions and called him a cheat. Now that's a very nasty word uh, and Norm was quite wrong in using that word, in my opinion. Uh, anyway, umpire Blue, and so would have I if I'd been him, and I reckon so would have Norm if he'd been him, uh, took exception to this and sued him. Because it's a very nasty, you know, below the belt word. Uh, so Norm's under the situation where he's going to be sued by the umpire. He goes to the club for assistance. Now, if I'd been the club uh, and Norm was a, an average coach or an average tenure coach, I might have said, well, mate, you're an experienced adult. You're an experienced football person. You're an experienced media person. You said it. You wear it. That's what I might have said. But at this stage, uh, Norm Smith had won... Uh, nine premierships as player or coach for his club. I mean, 
So you don't do those sort of... You, you, those sort of people, you just back to the hilt, even though you perhaps know he's wrong or think he's wrong. Uh, so in Melbourne, in saying no, I think we're very, very wrong. And to me, I think it... Uh, it created some tension there and the feeling wasn't anywhere near as good as it was previously. And I can remember myself seeing this uh, and I'm starting to get the age where perhaps coaching may be coming on stream or approaches in that m way were coming on. And I thought, well, who the hell would want to coach? I mean, he's the best coach in Australia getting sort of rounds of the kitchen, so to speak, from his club uh, why would you want to be a coach so i mean my opinion changed later but that's another story but yeah uh, it was very very sad and luckily for me i was at uh, the carlton footy club when this blue this uh, uh aggro stuff sort of started uh, happening uh, with norman he got to got the sack and i can remember actually i thought well i'm at carlton <coughs> I shouldn't be in this, but I, I just couldn't help myself. And I remember going over to the CEO's place, Jimmy Cardwell, they were called secretaries in those days, and uh, giving him a rounds of a kitchen for half an hour. And uh, So when you heard you were livid? I was, yeah. I, I was wrong in going over because it had nothing to do with me, but anyway, I had to go over and say something because uh, Norm and I were so close. And, and uh, yeah, I, well... Um, it was like sticking up for family. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, exactly right. Uh, I don't think anyone took real exception to it because they understood. How did, uh, how did the Tony Charlton football show uh, become a part of this entire episode? Well, oh, well, as I say, uh, it was circumstantial. Uh, he um, had been uh, engaged by me along with Dennis Corden as Melbourne representatives on the football panel. And because of the kind of person that he was, and despite, you can imagine, uh, with this eruption, everybody was after him to comment, and to offer him money if they if he would comment but he wouldn't and I didn't know of that until after the event he told me that they had approached him Norm Spencer of Channel 7 was one larger than life at the time and I would expect him to do that he was just doing his job but Smithy wouldn't do that he said he wouldn't talk until the football show on the Sunday morning this happened on the Friday night have you got clear recollections of that particular show? Because it must have been one of the most compelling pieces of football <laughs> television ever. Apart from misgivings about my own role and it seemed like um, a funeral service, he was just absolutely dramatic and dynamic. And he turned to the camera and said, you men of Melbourne. God, he gave it to them. And uh, uh, it was just an extraordinary experience. Well, it starts back, uh, I'd say a year or two ago. I think uh, when the committee failed to support me, or give me the support that I wanted uh, in this writ action, I, um, it was unacceptable to me that I could work with men who wouldn't back me, men who uh, would expect me to get the utmost from the players and demand from the players the loyalty and support, and at the other end of the line were not prepared to give me their support. That's where it started. I was just stunned to think, and the allegations one allegation was I told a deliberate lie. Anyone who knows me knows I wouldn't lie. I'd sooner fight than lie. I mean, I, I, I don't lie. The day he said it, and uh, the thing was, well, fancy them doing a thing like this to me without giving me the right. I was tried, sentenced, convicted, sentenced, without any right to express it on my, on my own behalf. This allegation now, later on in the show, we're going to have the captain and vice-captain Melbourne here, I hope. And they're going to tell you that one of these allegations is a complete and utter fabrication. There's only one way I'd ever go back to Melbourne. If those men offer themselves for election, they've never stood for an election. If they offer themselves for election, if they've got the courage of their convictions, they'll do this, Tony. But I don't think they will. They sit back in their snug and they, they don't even approach me. They do it behind my back, everything that's done down there. Why? They're things I don't do. As I said to the, uh, the President the other night, we got arguing at the committee over something on Wednesday night. I said, you went to a big school. He went to a public school. I went to a state school. I said, but they still spell principal the same way. And it's the principle for which I am fighting. I was brought up that way. Len was brought up that way. And if you haven't got principle, you haven't got anything. And I've got principle. And I'll fight for this principle to the day I die. 
What repercussions, Norm, do you expect this whole episode to have within the club? The repercussions I would like it to have is that every Melbourne football club supporter and every Melbourne cricket club supporter registers a protest in the strongest terms of the way it's been handled. Get rid of these blokes. That's the only way the club will progress. I have told the president, I have told the secretary, I spoke to them as friends. I said, look, the club's slipping, the club's slipping. This has been used again. I'm undermining them. I can see something happening that nobody else can see. I spoke to Ronnie this morning. He can see it. He could see it happening. Everyone can see it happening, but the fools who run it. What do you think you'll do, Norm? I don't know. I don't know. It's just toughy, isn't it? I don't know just what to do. You're full of fight. I'll fight. I'll fight if, I mean, if that can do any good. Norm was reinstated uh, very shortly thereafter, but there's no doubt that right at that point of time there was something missing, that the soul was missing within the club, um, that, the, that I only had to be told by other people, not me, because I hadn't been there before, I just knew it as, as Norm and my relationship with him, and that never wavered, and I certainly got from him, but, but from then on, I, uh, people just tell me the edge and, 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 the, and the really the, the unified culture of the place started to fall apart. Norm became a very mellow man. When he went to the Swans, and um, he made the finals down there in, in uh, 70 yeah. and I remember they had to go down to Geelong and win a match down there to stay in the finals and then we had, I went down with the team, you can't do that in those days, these days can you, Just go along with the team, they had a two carriage train that left from South Melbourne to go down to Canadian Park and um, we were all sitting there and he was a mellow man by then, he was enjoying life, this is the norm we would have liked to see in the 60s of course, uh, but um, Coming back on that train after the victory, where the Swans had made the finals, you can't imagine what it was like. And we're all sitting back there enjoying the old can, and Norm was singing and everything like that. Barash would have been shocked, really. All those Melbourne blokes would have been shocked. But that was that was Norm of another time, um, and Bobby Skilton was terrific with him, and he just had a, a terrific time. It was good that he had that time at South Melbourne when he could relax and enjoy his football instead of sort of um, being the, uh, the guru down at Melbourne. He must have been very proud of you by the time you died in 1973 to have seen this young fellow that you first knew as a, a teenager and even younger than that to see you develop to be a, a superstar well, I, player and then a, a very successful coach well, in your own right. I would imagine he would have been. He, yeah, I'd be surprised if he wasn't. Uh, but as I said before, he had his favourites, but didn't play favourites. <laughs> you must have been pretty proud of him too, to have oh, a legend of the game well, and, and have him such an important part of your oh, life. Gee, how lucky was I? I mean, I've been extremely blessed. And people say, well, that's uh, Ron's putting on a bit of an act here about modesty and all that stuff. I'm not. I'm, I've just been blessed to be in the right place at the right time. How should Norm Smith be remembered? How would you describe him as someone of my age that never had the privilege of meeting him? Uh, you missed out on meeting a mighty, a mighty, mighty person who was a, a, a great person, a great player, a great uh, coach. In football or in life, there are, are people who have uh, an indelible you know, impression on you and really have a, a big impact on, on how you think, not just about your football, but about your life, and, and in my own case, Norm Smith was one of those. He could be tough and everything like that, but he saw you not only as a footballer, he saw you as a human being, as an individual. I love the man. Yeah, I came to Collingwood at 15, so uh, I knew pretty well about the rivalry between Collingwood and Melbourne. And it all led from the coaches, because Fonce Kine and Norm Smith had a great uh, fondness of each other too. I was probably respect, because uh, they'd, they'd gone back a fair way in their playing career. And uh, I can't remember any cold showers, by the way, out of Collingwood, but uh, you never know, there might have been. Their phenomenal September rivalry would see them meet on grand final day five times in ten years, starting in 1955 and 56. 
Melbourne prevailing by 28 and 73 points respectively. The Dees went on to smash Essendon by 61 points in 1957, setting up a blockbuster 1958 grand final against Collingwood. The Magpies desperate to defend their league record of four straight premierships. Well, the greats of, the, of, of Collingwood were, were about then anyway, because you had Sid Coventry, the great Sid Coventry, who, uh, who captained those four premiership teams. I mean, Sid was about, he was chairman of selectors. And then you had Harry Collier and, uh, and Gordon Hocking and those fellows who, who played in those, uh, some of those premiership teams. Harry certainly, Harry and Lita Collier played in, in those uh, six premierships in that period of 10 years. So they were about, and, and we knew how important it was, but you've got to be able to do it on the day. Melbourne went in as unbackable favourites. Collingwood having been unable to defeat their rivals in their last 10 clashes, including a 45-point thumping in the second semi-final just a fortnight earlier. 98,000 saw the Dees live up to their favouritism early, with stars like Barassi, Laurie Mithen and Big Bob Johnson dominating. But Collingwood upped the ante in the second term of the 58 grand final, systematically roughing up Melbourne's potential match winners with a game plan based around hard hits, hard tackles and regular flare-ups. The tempo changed, with brawls aplenty, as the Demons completely lost their focus as they looked to return Collingwood's physicality in kind. The Pies, well, they took control where it mattered most, ultimately scoring a hard-fought 18-point win in arguably the greatest upset in grand final history to defend their proud record of four straight premierships. We played very, very well on the day. Uh, the, the conditions were, were, uh, were quite heavy. The ball was a bit slippery, and, uh, and we had a pretty young team mixed with some good experienced players two or three champion players and uh, and we went after the ball pretty hard and uh, Melbourne didn't react too well it was a big upset oh it was a huge upset. I mean they're a powerful team it's talking about someone a team playing in six consecutive grand finals uh, and and won five of the six I know and in real fact they would have won six consecutive premierships which surely would never have been beaten if we hadn't rolled them in 58, so it was a it was a huge upset. There's no uh, no question about that. Melbourne regrouped to win the 1959 flag with a 37 point win over Essendon, before claiming their seventh straight minor premiership in 1960, winning through to face Collingwood once again on that last Saturday in September. For the Demons, it was all about revenge. That shock loss in 1958 still burning in the pit of their stomachs some two years later. I can remember the 1960 grand final and come into the ground all the players were receiving advice from uh, the supporters because two years before in 58 uh, we should have won theoretically uh, but on the day Collingwood were the better side and, and we we lost and we lost because we didn't stick to our game plan our we got sucked in by uh, hard stuff and all that, all that. So two years later, I've never seen a team more united. So uh, that was the, probably the, the culmination of any feeling against Collingwood. Heavy rain on the Friday night and Saturday morning of the 1960 grand final raised Magpie hopes of a repeat of the 1958 boil over. But as Ron just mentioned, the Demons ran out like men possessed, booting four goals three to no score in the opening term. Collingwood looked to shake things up a bit in the second term, but this time around, Melbourne wouldn't be sucked in, holding the Pies to a solitary goal in the first half. By three-quarter time, the Dees had booted seven goals, 12, to just two goals to hold a commanding 42-point lead in a low-scoring scrap in waterlogged conditions. Bear in mind that the vision that you're about to see, that there's no out-of-bounds on the full penalty in 1960, that rule didn't come into effect until 1969, so don't get confused when you see it thrown back in after a player has clearly kicked it in over the fence, an option that modern-day defenders can only dream about. Well, we'll pick up play at the start of the final term. It's the 1960 grand final. Melbourne lead it by 42 points. Your commentators are Roy Wright and Graham Cope. Everything in readiness for the start of the last quarter, the Victorian Football League grand final, Melbourne versus Collingwood. Melbourne leading by 42 points at three-quarter time. Umpire Irving blows the whistle and bounces the ball for the start of the final quarter, the VFL grand final. Melbourne in the white nicks almost black most of them by mud and Melbourne going into attack through Case round onto the centre wing position towards Dixon and Hutchison there's a chance for Little Burns to Brewer 
and Collingwood at half forward right with a chance to go into attack Collingwood kicking to the scoreboard goal in this last quarter and Brewers kick out of bounds Forty two points the difference, Melbourne seven twelve, Collingwood two goals. Brewer once more prominent. Plenty of weight, no issues shirked at whatsoever in this grand final. This ball will be thrown in between the members wing and Collingwood's right half forward flank. Len Mann in front of the pack, but Wiedemann there. Up towards the pocket. That has been the pattern all day. As soon as the Collingwood player gets the ball, he's completely surrounded and swamped by Melbourne players. Again, Len Mann doing a lot of work in the ruck for Melbourne. Brewer. Lord diving with Wiedemann and Thoroughgood backing up trip for Collingwood you can see then Tripp was very strongly harassed by Laidlaw trying to get a kick once more it's Len Mann the third time in succession out to Dixon Kevin Rose carrying that ball over the line on the member stand the wing centre wing position this time it's Gabalich to Wiedemann and Wiedemann awarded a free kick Barassi was in front couldn't hold the mark off the ground by Case to the centre the mud patch in the centre Delante leading in the race for the ball from Tunbridge, but Tunbridge cleverly to Mithen, and Mithen will be awarded a free kick for excessive manhandling. Well, there you can see the difference. A Collingwood player attempted to pick that ball up, but Melbourne scooped it off the ground of someone going past. That's been the difference all day between these two sides. Bill Thripp, the Collingwood centre half, back in the way. Collingwood half-back line has been under a lot of pressure right throughout the game. Into the centre again. Man in front. Well, that's a, a pretty sticky sight on your screens. Umpire Irving. Try and find a dry spot, perhaps. No. <laughs> Into the air. O'Dwyer. Laidlaw. Missing it. Tunbridge. Bob Johnson and Mick Toomey position is between centre half forward and full forward with Melbourne in attack chance for a trip there goes Roweth round into the pocket and the throw in to take place No change in score since the final term started three and a half minutes ago. Melbourne 7-12, Collingwood two goals. <laughs> Kevin Rose was completely surrounded. Then three Melbourne players swooped on him as he came through with the ball. It's been mainly Melbourne's uh, backing of one another up, plus their pace that has uh, given Collingwood this task of trying to catch them today. Aguirre for Collingwood. And it looks as though Brewer has been giving a run, giving a run on the ball. Uh, Fellows is in that pocket now and Brewer is up on the, in the ruck work. Turner for Collingwood. Out into the centre again, looking for Wiedemann. Lord persisting, but this time it's Collingwood through Beers. Out on wide onto the flank. Burns driving them up to full forward on one of their rare excursions up to goal and again you saw one of the pretty heavy physical clashes that have been characteristic of this grand final the ball to be thrown in between half and full forward right Collingwood in attack Burns again but 
for the most part this pattern still the same Collingwood's uh, moves up forward being smothered as a general rule there's Turner Tassie Johnson Wiedemann unable to do anything and umpire Irving will bounce the ball Len Mann once more he played very very well in the ruck he's taken right over since halfway through the first quarter and he's really missed a hit out that he's gone for So Dwyer shooting for goal, close. One behind, kicked by Ronnie O'Dwyer. Well, I guess that rates applause because it's Collingwood first, Collingwood's first behind for the match. And the first score for this term. So it's Tassie Johnson's first kick in for the match for Melbourne. We'll probably see him at various stages throughout the game, but the Melbourne Messenger has been doing a power of work throughout the match. He spent much of the game on the ground. That's Tunbridge. Splendid ball handling. Tunbridge is one is the main reason with man, I would say, for uh, Melbourne's uh, lead at this stage. They've completely dominated the half-forward line and they've given them a continual drive down there. It's Turner getting a hand pass away but intercepted by Melbourne. Turner again, flashing in. And still, 7-12, 54 Melbourne to 2-1, 13 Collingwood. It was Harrison that time in the ruck. John Lord. <laughs> That's out wide of the centre, out towards the centre wing position. That's, I think it's Harrison underneath all that. Gradually extricates himself and umpire Irving wants more of the honours. Well, what can you say about that? <laughs> Gablich and Trevor Johnson contesting the hit out. No chance for Collingwood to work the ball up forward. Past the mighty Magpies there. Mascot sign. Half forward left. And still 41 points the difference. As you can see, the sun shining on the Melbourne cricket ground. Then it was, now it's not. There's a free kick to O'Dwyer. Up to full forward, O'Dwyer's kick. Farragut was waiting back. And a clearing kick round in the direction of uh, Hassa Mann. Back to Dixon, but Mann was adjudged over the boundary line. His final term has been in progress for nine and a half minutes. Bob Johnson now taking a turn on the ball with Fellows and uh, Wiedemann. Methan for Melbourne up towards the centre half forward position. Mick Toomey out to Fripp, but Dixon it was. Intercepting very quickly. Roweth with a clear go. And there's Roweth kick straight through the middle. A beautiful kick by Roweth. He picked a beautiful hand, uh, picked the ball up very, very cleanly, and he put it was a, a floating punt that he kicked, and it floated right through the centre. Melbourne going further ahead, 8 12 60 to Collingwood, 2 1 13. telecast of the Victorian Football League Grand Final between Melbourne and Collingwood coming to you through 
Channel 2, the ABC Sporting Service. Thoroughgood again for Melbourne. Out onto the centre wing. Has a man and his opponent Rose. Hutchison going through to Thrip. And Collingwood with the chance now to fire the ball out onto the centre wing where Gray marks. Gablich and he was about one foot over the boundary line. And Collingwood's 20th man Chapman has come onto the field replacing Errol Hutchison who walks around the boundary line. Tazzy Johnson back towards the centre. That's Keneally and O'Dwyer. O'Dwyer winning out. Up to full forward for Collingwood. And it's Beers marking about 30 yards out from goal on a slight angle. Brian Beers with the chance to goal. The sun comes out just as he takes his kick. And it's one behind only. Collingwood's second score for the term, another behind, 2-2-14, Melbourne 8-12-60. Melbourne would go on to add a further two behinds to exact some measure of revenge for their 1958 failure by emphatically claiming the 1960 title by 48 points. Favourite son Ron Barassi added premiership captain to his ever-growing list of achievements. Here's Ron accepting the cup with legendary coach Norm Smith standing behind him there in the trench coat. And after a winning grand final was the only time, Ron tells me, that he was happy to wear a Collingwood jumper. Back in the days when opponents traditionally swap Guernseys after the final siren. A great idea at the time, but it's made for generations of ex-footballers wishing they'd kept their premiership jumper later in life. Barass and his opposing captain Murray Wiedemann pretty much knew each other as well as any grand final skippers in history. They'd been playing with and against each other since they were juniors. Here's what they had to say after the 1960 Grand Final. We'll start with a 24-year-old Ron Barassi looking splendid in his dressing gown. And if you're thinking there is something missing, there's not a sponsor's logo in sight. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the captain of Melbourne, Premier's 1960. Congratulations, Ron. Thank you very much. How are you feeling? Pretty tired, I guess. Well, I think the reaction set in. I feel a bit flat at the moment. I feel almost the same as I'd last, but by about 8 o'clock tonight, I'll be kicking on a bit. <laughs> I reckon you will be. Ron, did you ever in your wildest dreams imagine that, uh, that you would win by quite so much in these conditions? Uh, no, not in these conditions. I thought we possibly would win by this much if we uh, had the dry conditions. But, uh, well, it just proves that providing we have the right mental approach, and uh, which is that's a very important thing, providing we have that, I mean, we've got the team to back it up. If we have the right mental approach where we uh, can have really good wins against any side, I, I reckon, anyway. Mm. Has all that hatred, bitterness, jealousy and envy that we talked about last <laughs> night, has that all gone for now? All gone until next year. <laughs> <laughs> until next year. When do you feel that you won it, Ron, in the first quarter? Yes, in the first quarter, and uh, every man rose to it, and uh, we, we tackled and harassed them just the way we did against uh, Fitzroy, and uh, in, the, in the main, really, really got in for that ball, and had a mean attitude as far as letting him have any say in whatsoever in doing what they want to do with it, Graham. Well, Ron, I know you're tired and I know you've got other people to talk to. Thanks very much for sparing us this time Thank and once much. more, congratulations. Thank you. Murray, bad luck, but uh, thank you very much for coming round. I know, knew you'd be here, win or lose. Yes, well, uh, congratulations to Ron and his side. They did a wonderful job. I, we weren't in the hunt all day and I'm a bit disappointed that the uh, public didn't get their money's worth. Uh, I think we might have fallen and we might have been our uh, fault this time. 58, Melbourne came back at us when we started a bit of rough stuff, but uh, this time we, we went in hard after the ball and they wouldn't have any bar of it. <laughs> so I think it put backfired on us a little bit. But yeah. congratulations to Melbourne, they're a wonderful side and they're really tough. A very gracious Collingwood captain, Murray Wiedemann, speaking immediately after their 1960 grand final loss to Melbourne. He had a bit of young Paul Newman about him, didn't he, Murray, with his Hollywood-like good looks, and he was certainly a footballing superstar in his own right. Married to a former Miss Victoria, he was a larger-than-life on-field enforcer who dished it out and copped it sweet. And he stunned the Collingwood committee when he announced that he would join the ranks of professional wrestling a couple of seasons later. He almost lost the captaincy over the issue before it all ultimately blew over and the football planets realigned themselves. These two powerhouse sides would meet again on grand final day in 1964 in what turned out to be one of the greatest and most thrilling grand finals of all time. 
Collingwood skipper Ray Gabalich put the pies in front at the 21 minute mark of the final term after a memorable 70 yard run and goal. Before Demon back pocket Neil Crompton wrote his name into the annals of football history with the winning goal, his first for the season, some two minutes later. Melbourne home by four points to claim their sixth premiership in ten years under legendary coach Norm Smith and sealing another famous chapter in their incredible rivalry with the Magpies. Little did the delirious Melbourne fans know at the time, however, but their favourite son Ron Barassi had just played his final game for the Dees and their super coach Norm Smith would soon have a falling out and be sensationally sacked by the club midway through the following season. Things never to be quite the same again at Demonland. Well, that's it.